Well, welcome everyone to the Audio Codec Technology Webinar. This is Reliable Audio Transport over Unreliable Networks. My name is Derek Badala. I am with Syntax. We are the uh, distributor of RME, Pro Audio Solutions, Ferrofish, Digigram, uh, Alva Cable, MyMix. So um, we're very excited to share what we have today. For those of you that are here looking for CTS credits, at the end of this webinar, I will give you instructions on how you can get three CTS Avixa credits. If you have any questions, for those of you that are in the Zoom environment, feel free to ask your question live or send a chat. For those of you that are watching us uh, live on social media, you can ask your questions in the chat there. So we'll get started. So before we kind of dive right into this, what we want to really cover is IP audio technology so that everybody understands how we're going to do reliable audio over unreliable networks. So really to get started, this is sort of a summary of what we'll be talking about. What is IP? What is IP audio? IP audio and broadcast. We'll talk about compression types, bit rate, uh, doing audio over public internet, so a wide area network, which is really where folks are looking to use this technology and learn more about doing streaming. Excuse me. And for those of you that are doing professional broadcast uh, stuff, you're going to find this particularly useful. We'll talk about some technology solutions that you're going to want to know about for doing reliable audio over the internet uh, and give you some solutions. So you can ask questions. We'll show you some application diagrams, etc. So I always like to start with an overview of an environment of what we're looking at. So what you're seeing kind of unfold in front of you is a typical broadcast situation. So, and we really break it into three separate areas, remote broadcasting, on air or studio, and program distribution. The program distribution uh, essentially is taking your audio and sending it out to several destinations, a, an audience on web radio, maybe sending it to a transmitter site or satellite or another facility. And while this diagram sort of shows radio or television infrastructures, this can also apply to venues and remote mixing and musicians and all kinds of different unique streaming environments that folks have been looking to do over the last, you know, 14 months. The remote broadcasting side on the left is contribution, being in the field, being at home, being on your cell phone, being remote in some way and contributing audio back to a truck or a studio or something like that. And the studio is where we can receive multiple streams from multiple folks from multiple remote locations at one time. So this is going to be the environment in which we talk about. So what is IP? We keep hearing this audio over IP. And within the IP audio broadcast world, there's a term you might come across called RTP. What, what is this? So essentially getting really basic here, and we don't want to go too deep in the weeds. IP audio or just IP in general, is it consists of datagrams. And these are self-contained entities of packets of data that have to be pushed from source to destination. And the IP protocol establishes this end-to-end, -end encoder to decoder communication link over networks, whether we're talking in our house, in an office, or over the internet. And there's always a best effort of these networks to deliver audio in this case, or just data, uh, and making sure that these packets of datagrams all arrive, that they're not corrupted in any way, that the order of these packets are not uh, messed up due to all of the different hops that the data will take over the internet. And in some cases, ensure that the packets aren't duplicated. So this is just basic internet protocol, kind of high level stuff. Now, when we go a little deeper, many of us who've been using the internet for many years now are probably familiar with the idea of an IP address. An IP address, um, there's one address of every device on a network. Uh, when we're talking about our local network, it's within our router. When we're talking about the public internet, what is the IP address of my internet connection at home of, or of my router? There's a public IP and then there's a local IP. And it can be defined manually or automatically. And there's unique 
identifiers. But the first bullet you see on my slide here is the most important when it comes to redundancy and talking about IP audio streaming. Because there's one IP address per network interface, which is found in the device. So when you're talking about your computer, you have a network interface, an Ethernet port. If we're talking about an IP codec, there's an Ethernet port. Uh, if we're talking about a Wi-Fi device, there's an IP address of that device established. And then we're going to come back to this in a moment, but I want to make sure everybody's on the same page when we discuss the idea of IP addresses and that everything on a network has unique address. We also have user datagram protocol, UDP. This was developed in 1980. It was one of the core members of the protocol suite. And it's really used for what we kind of refer to now as loss tolerant connections, things that are not vital, like continuous video and audio, where if that were interrupted, it would be a nuisance. If you're controlling your remote desktop and your mouse is a little laggy and things are not perfect, UDP is perfectly fine for that, but it's not suitable for multimedia applications. So later on in the 90s up to the early 2000s, RTP, that's where that term comes from, real-time protocol was developed. And this is really the protocol that was developed to deliver audio and video over IP networks. And it typically runs on top of the user uh, the UDP protocol and use in conjunction with something called RTCP, which is RTP with controlled data. So the RTCP carries things like what are the transmission statistics? What's the quality of service, synchronization, sample rate, um, all that kind of stuff. So RTP is how we transmit audio and video or both over IP networks. Now there's another term you're going to run into called SIP. It stands for signal, it's a signaling protocol and it stands for session initiation protocol. Again, to operate these networks and overcome the challenges, you don't need to understand all of the, you know, real detailed technical knowledge. But what you do need to understand is what it's used for. SIP is used for signaling devices. It, it allows you to have devices over the internet where you don't know the IP address, but when it comes online, your boxes can connect, established connections with each other, and you can actually communicate. There's more proprietary technology used by several manufacturers within a SIP infrastructure, but in its most basic form, SIP is used to basically say, here I am, I want to connect to you. So that is what is used in a lot of broadcast applications. So doing IP audio and broadcast or streaming, this is what we know. We know that we have IP technology. It's going to be used to carry the information. We know that RTP is the standard protocol. We know that SIP is a typical uh, session initiation protocol used to establish connections. It's not always the only one, but it's the most common. And the, there's going to be two factors that affect audio quality. Number one is audio compression and network bitrate. This is going to impact how audio is transmitted. So why do we use audio compression in IP audio? Well, we have to because we have to, we have to adapt to the bitrate of our network. And there's two types of audio compression. And if you're an audio engineer, you've probably heard these terms, lossless and lossy algorithms. In the broadcast world, we use lossy algorithms because we can basically identify to a fixed bit rate and we get a more reliable and a more useful compression ratio that, it, that we can accomplish in our network. So we're going to use lossy algorithms. We're going to add compression to the audio to adapt to the bit rate, but of course we're going to add a little bit of latency to do so. So there's compressions for spoken word or voice, or what we used to call VOIP, voice over IP. And there's also compressions for high quality or complex audio, ideally music. Uh, these are just some examples, MPEG-2, MPEG-3, better known as MP2, MP3, AAC, Opus, etc. So we're gonna run into these compression selections in our codecs, no matter what manufacturer solution you go with. So this is why we cover this. Now you can also do uncompressed audio in an IP stream, but of course it's gonna take a faster bit rate to do it. And this is the idea of just doing what we refer to as PCM, uh, which is pulse code modulation. It's not important you understand that fully, but just basically that the audio is represented by a sequence of snapshots and those are not compressed in any way. Now, to do audio over IP, let's say we're talking 24-bit 48K, you can see from this chart that you know you need a fairly fast bit rate to do uncompressed audio. 24-bit 48K is 2.3 megabits per second. 
Um, so we want to get that down to a, uh, a, a network bit rate. When we start adding multiple audio channels and transmitting over one internet per, uh, ISP, one internet service, we need to get down into the kilobits per second. So several compression algorithms were developed over the years. You probably heard of some of these, MP2, uh, which was all about creating CD quality or what was perceived to be CD quality back in the day uh, and do it at 256 kilobits per second. And at the time, it was selected as a reference compression ratio for broadcast radio. Later on, MP3 came along. It had one goal, cut it in half. So basically get it to 128 kilobits per second for this, what was perceived to be the same audio quality as MP2. And that's basically been the web radio format that we're using to this day. We're all familiar with MP3 as it relates to music listening on our iPods, etc. But over the years, especially more recently, several other flavors have emerged. Audio advanced compress or advanced audio compression, better known as AAC, and you'll typically find it in your codex as AAC. And several flavors of AAC were developed from 1997 to 2016, all with one goal: give us the best audio quality for music on a bit rate that is slower. Somebody's Wi-Fi connection, 3G, 4G, stuff like that. And again, if we start compounding audio channels, that's going to use up uh, bandwidth. We have also have another compression uh, algorithm out there that you're going to run into called Opus. Um, Opus is popular because you don't have to pay a license fee to adopt it into your hardware or software. Uh, it's royalty free or open source, and it's adequate for speech and complex audio. When I say it's adequate, this is what the, the Society of Broadcast Engineers have sort of said and, uh, you know, anointed that this is an adequate, um, widely used, widely accepted compression ratio. There's others as well, like APTX, uh, and as I said a minute ago, several flavors of AAC. So I put together a chart just to give you a, a frame of reference or a benchmark of what kind of IP bit rate and what latency occurs for doing standard stereo 24-bit 48K audio because you're going to use this chart and the math uh, related to this chart when you're starting to figure out, I want to do 16 audio channels from my station or my studio or my truck or my home and send it elsewhere. What kind of upload and download speeds do I need for my internet service provider? So as you can see, PCM, and by the way, this is sorted fastest to slowest. So PCM at the top gives me the best audio quality because I'm not using compression. It has the lowest latency. So you can see I'm highlighting the seven milliseconds with my mouse. We get up into MPEG-2 and AAC and Opus, sort of the middle of this chart. We're in the kilobits per second instead of megabits per second. Perfectly acceptable, perfectly achievable with most residential internet. And the milliseconds for latency, encoder to decoder, source to destination, is still very acceptable. So we typically find in the broadcast community, and when I say broadcast community, I mean radio and TV, professional broadcast, we're in the AAC opus quite often. And so this is going to be important when we talk about reliable audio over unreliable networks because these will be parameters you need to understand and choose in setting up your networks. So what about audio over LAN? Over the last 10 years, this has been a big topic. AOIP is another buzzword you see a lot. And this is basically not the internet, not a wide area network, but a local area network. Think of your home network or your office network where you have switches, your computers are connected to those switches. Well, LAN audio or AOIP as it's typically referred to, this is the typical setup. You have microphones and you have speakers and mixers, uh, etc. that is basically able to transmit audio. And you can connect these things and there are, there are different protocols that you've probably heard of like Dante or AS67, etc. Uh, so that are used for this type of application. I'm getting a question here. Yeah, there's not much I can do about the logo. I apologize uh, on the smartphone side. We'll just have to kind of live with that. So when doing audio over LAN, probably the most popular or what we hear about a lot lately is Dante. 
Um, but there's other formats like Livewire and Wheatnet and QLAN and AS67. And all of these work because there's device synchronization on the local network. And there's the ability to precision clock all of these devices. There's also technologies that were developed, proprietary, to see what devices are on the network and make sure everything is properly synchronized. But more importantly, since this is not a LAN webinar, but more of a WAN, wide area network webinar, what's the difference between LAN audio and audio over wide area network? Well, there are a lot more challenges to solve. So when I show this picture again, where we got devices anywhere in the world connected via the internet, there are challenges that need to be solved. And audio over IP has been evolving since the pandemic because folks want to do things and were required to do things remotely. So there's been several applications of who is the customer for doing this type of audio because we normally think of it as radio broadcasting and TV and sports commentary, but it's changed a lot, especially over the last 14 months. So we have our traditional broadcast applications for doing audio over a WAN, but we also have distance learning, music schools, universities, trade shows, audio demonstrations, multimedia presentations that have to take place remotely now. How do we make sure that the audio quality of the music class, of the audio demonstration, et cetera, is as if I'm in the room, because that's what we're essentially trying to recreate. Corporate AV, doing remote translation. Think of the United Nations. You have folks that used to gather and congregate. Now you have the ability with audio codecs and audio over IP over wide area network to have your translators offsite, listening to audio in a very high quality way and translating in real time so that folks can listen. Houses of worship, churches, you want to be able to broadcast the audio from maybe the main campus and send it over to the other campuses. And when I say the audio, I don't just mean a stereo feed of what's happening at the main campus, but taking all of the individual audio channels from a Dante or Maddie network, for example, broadcasting them to several campuses and then remixing them in those campuses, just to name a few other uh, ways that could be used. Web radio broadcasting. Anybody with a live venue, whether it's a church, a performing arts center, uh, a music school, a K through 12 environment, anything with music recitals, any kind of audio performances that are going on, everyone should consider a web radio solution that is simple, easy, very cost effective, no FCC requirements, uh, should consider that. Musicians and artists have been trying to do live performances for over a year now from home and of course ran into audio difficulties because the primary purpose of their performance is to hear how great they sound. We can bring that sound back to the scenario with this technology. Remote production, being able to remotely record folks as if the internet is a mic cable. Uh, pro audio, that market wanting to do remote mixing now, connecting consoles remotely as if the remote console is at the venue, maybe for training, troubleshooting, or other reasons that would happen, remote screening. So these are just a few, quite a few, ways that this, this market has evolved because of the pandemic. So doing audio over the internet is becoming more and more uh, a need. And another way to say doing audio over the internet, streaming. That's the word everybody throws out. Sometimes it means video, sometimes it means audio, sometimes it means both. So what is the challenge in streaming? Point to point or point to many points using the public internet. Well, there's no quality of service with the internet. There's no guaranteed bit rate because there's several switches and hops and the data is taking all kinds of uh, paths to its destination. Packets are lost, duplicated, disordered, there's jitter. All of that is a problem. So the challenges that have to be solved to do audio over the internet are receiving all the packets, managing disordered packets, Managing late packets due to jitter of the network, managing clock drift, making sure that my sample rate on the destination is the same as it was on the source, just as an example. All of that is possible with what we're going to share with you. So there's a company by the name of Digigram that developed a technology called Fluid IP. And this was developed and evolved since 2009. And it may not be something you're familiar with. Basically, its goal was several things. Build it in every unit. So it's always there, give you the highest quality audio, give you very high quality transport stability, 
give you redundancy, which in any pro audio situation, redundancy is always something engineers are trying to establish so that they never go down. And then extremely low latency. Those are just some of the things that we're trying to do. One of the comments on the live stream is primarily solid internet upload as well as clean low latency have been the most challenging as a live streaming artist. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. So I'm going to show you how Fluid IP can provide that for you moving forward. So what makes Digigram unique? I mean, there's been broadcast radio and TV going on for 30 years. And obviously those folks have been doing streaming, what we refer to as streaming for a very long time. How do we make this technology accessible to the average person who's also trying to stream? And why use Digigram when there's other technologies that exist? So what, in other words, what makes Digigram unique? It's really three key benefits. And this addresses the comment on YouTube about low latency and solid internet. First of all, the Digigram solutions are adaptable to any network, and I'm gonna go into more detail about what that means. There's error correction available when needed, and I'm gonna talk about that. And then there's 100%, and I really should underline that word, 100% redundancy with these Digigram solutions. So those are the three key benefits that make your stream possible without interruption, which is what every professional is looking for. So the first one is, talk about the most adaptable solution. So when I talked about all those audio compression algorithms, these are all built in to the Fluid IP Digigram engine. And the reason I say that, because it might not seem like a big deal, is that some of these have licensing costs associated with it. So many manufacturers do not adopt all of these algorithms in their solutions. You have to pay extra. Digigram said, nope, we're gonna put it all in there. So no, whether I'm doing voice or high quality audio or I'm on a low, low quality network, I can choose the right format for me that day to get my program from you know, source to destination. Number two, all this idea of, of error correction, because a lot of companies claim they have it. What Digigram does is they allow you to additionally generate more packets than the, the, the main packets so that your decoder can receive duplicate information to reconstruct the original stream without any option dropouts or anything else. It's almost like a faucet and a spigot where you can turn up the amount of error correction that you want. There is a consequence of using error correction because you're asking the decoder to work harder, so you will add some latency, so you have to factor that in when you do choose to use it. And as such, having it work like a spigot, you can dial it into exactly what you want. You want 5%, 10%, 20% error correction, whatever you need to get, what, get your signal to work on the network of the day. And number three, and the most important, is the redundancy. There is what we call spatial diversity and what we call time diversity as part of this redundant stream. And I think this graphic illustrates it most clearly, where you have your encoder, uh, at the source and a decoder somewhere else over the internet. And because the encoder has more than one IP address, the, so we get back to the, I, the IP address conversation, there's more than one network interface, there's two separate IP addresses, and the can take a completely separate path over the internet to its destination. So we have 100% true redundant streaming. And that redundant stream, that duplicate stream can also be delayed um, and you can set that uh, depending on what you're trying to do. So if there is a catastrophic internet event, chances are your stream is not interrupted. The decoder can reconstruct the stream and there's no dropouts and no interruption to what you're doing. So those are the three primary things that Digigram does differently. Most all codecs address things like jitter, address clock drift, and things like that. So that's important because you need to have everything in synchronous, uh, synchronized. So what does some dual streaming setups look like? Well, here's an example of a venue, uh, say in New York and another venue, say in Los Angeles. And we have a hardware codec in New York that is perhaps speaking Dante. So we have a local network of audio, say 64, 120 channels that go into the local area network port of the codec. And then there's a two separate internet paths 
to Los Angeles, and then it's received and decoded back into whatever format I need. It could be Dante, it could be MADI, it could be ASEBU, for example. But the key here in this diagram is all the packets are received. Disordered packets are reordered, audio is synchronized, clock drift is corrected, and high audio quality is maintained no matter how unreliable the network is or how many things are changing over the course of an hour or two, which is what happens with the internet. We also can multicast. So in addition to doing one source to one destination, we can also take a source and go to several destinations. And it's important to note the green lines in this diagram are actually bidirectional or full duplex. All right, I'm getting a question or a comment online. The redundancy DSP latency is not something you notice locally. If so, it's not something the audience experiences latency. No, I mean, it's basically going to be, you know, latency is going to be more from the perspective of the broadcaster of what's going on with the original source and how much time does it take to get to its destination? And do I need, do I need the folks at the destination to react to that audio and the reaction to come back to me? That's where latency is going to be noticed by the audience. And not all applications have a latency problem. Or another way to put it is not all applications need to take into account of latency. What do I mean by that? Well, maybe you have an audience in LA listening to something happening in New York. Does it really matter that what LA is hearing is 200 milliseconds later? Not really, unless they're trying to synchronize it to something. And there are ways to synchronize the digigram audio to video if that is the case by using a jitter buffer setting. So it is something you can actually align. So coming back to the to the dual streaming. So here's another example, Madison Square Garden, Staples Center. And this might be not just multi-channel audio, but this could also be intercom and, and IFB and other things too. So it's like basically connecting two, in this slide, connecting two Dante networks together. So what are the solutions that we're showing here? What are they called? So in my diagram that I've flashed up here a couple times now, I have highlighted in red these solutions. They're all the same product in many, just they're in different places in the application depending on what you want the product to do. I've highlighted the Akoya Talk on the left and the crosslink and serve link you see in many different places because they can do multi-function things depending on where they are in your design. They are called or pronounced Icoya, crosslink, not X-link, but crosslink and serve link. That's how, that's how you refer to them. And these are all hardware IP audio codecs. I've highlighted in red that the main difference, you know, how many channels, What's the local audio connectivity? Is it analog? Is it Dante? Is it AS3? Is it MADI? Um, how many codecs can I encode and decode with a single 1RU box? So that's pretty much what we're outlining here. You'll also notice on the bottom row, there are things that like say one to eight stereo codecs or two to eight, or in the case of the serve link, four to 64 or 128, because these are scalable. That means they come in a base model with two codecs and you can scale it with a software update that you can purchase from your Digigram dealer uh, and, br and make that solution up to 16 or 64 or 128 channels. So you're not paying for codecs you're not using basically. The other thing that's new this month is the Crosslink MPX, which actually allows you to take FM signals and use IP codecs to transmit them over the internet as well. So that has a lot of applications, especially in radio. So these products have been used well over 10 years now. And Digigram as a company is the company that developed EtherSound. They are no stranger to audio over IP. Um, but these products are used 365 days, 24 seven operation by some very big names in the business. Um, they're ST2110 compatible. They support all the pro audio formats. So if you are seriously considering uh, what is going on here, then basically this is going to be for you. Now I'm getting a question. Why can't this be done in software? 
Well, the problem with software is now you're adding a layer of complexity. Your computer, in many situations, your computer is being asked to do several things at once, depending on what it is. So by having a dedicated hardware solution that's always on, always working with redundancy, that is not a victim of Microsoft or Apple operating system issues and other variables that can creep in with software. This, this is why in broadcasts and in sports broadcasting, radio, they don't, they don't use software as their primary infrastructure. Yeah, they use software for certain connections, but their primary multicast distribution of several dozen channels, they use hardware that's built for a very specific task and to do it 24 seven. Um, I've had many situations where software does not run well uh, in a 24 seven application. And there's other arguments that can be made as well. Typical back panel on this codec is what you'd expect to find. XLR inputs, ASEBU inputs, multi-pin inputs. There's GPIOs. You can serially transmit data as well. Also, we have redundant ports on the back. So there's four. Two of them are for your LAN. Two of them are for your internet. You also have in the case of using this at a transmitter site or something along those lines, there's an SD card reader for backup playlists. So if, if you lose IP, then you're, you're not going off air. Also, yes, redundancy are the dual stream stuff that I'm talking about, correct. So the serve link, I wanna talk about the serve link a little more specific because the serve link is the one hardware box that a lot of folks are attracted to because of the fact that it does such a high channel count. Um, due to the fact that it does a high channel count, we can do analog, AS3, MADI, AS67, and Dante. So I can use it to receive multiple software or hardware codec communications at one time. So if I'm Major League Baseball, I can have announcers all over the country and receive everybody into New Jersey at the same time. Uh, with a single rack space. I can put it in my remote truck. At the Olympics, this, is, this technology is used to transmit what's going on, say, in Tokyo back to the States, etc. So what I'd like to do is play a video that sort of gives you some ideas of how this might be used. <laughs> for doing those types of things like with several audio channels at one time and typically at this point people start to kind of circle back to this chart because you're saying hey I can take 128 channels of Dante and transmit it what kind of network am I going to need to do that 
Well, this goes back to our conversation about all the different audio compressions. So we start taking something like Opus that's only requiring 160 kilobits per second for two channels of 48K 24-bit audio, and we make that a dozen or two dozen or three dozen channels. We're still in a very acceptable network bit rate for that. These solutions, uh, this is addressing a question that just came in on YouTube. Yes, these are all 19-inch rack solutions. And there is a smaller solution in software and portability that I'm about to present to you as well. So if your question is uh, preempting my next couple slides. So you're right there, so be patient. So what about network security? If I'm doing LAN audio and it's on a local area network, how do I protect the network. So if I have a uh, an audio codec in a company at the United Nations at a house of worship, um, not every network that's doing audio is just audio only. Sometimes there's protected data and privileged data. So how does Digigram address that? Well, what they do, you know, you when you started using these LAN audio formats, you have to put the codec further behind the firewall. So the audio codec can become a vulnerability spot. So what Digigram has done is they've put their LX Dante or Matty card or some, some PCIe solution in the hardware. So it's a full hardware separation between the WAN and the LAN. Um, so it isolates it. There's no way to hack the LAN because of how that's accomplished. All right, so to the person's question about smaller solutions, the Akoya Talk is one of those solutions that I wanna to present to you. The Akoya Talk, and I'm going to play this video in a second, but the Akoya Talk is a portable codec that is like a smartphone, a mixer, and a codec all in one. So let me play this video. It kind of give you a nice overview. It's kind of entertaining to watch, and we'll talk more detail about it. So hopefully that video presentation gives you a little bit of an idea of what is possible with the Akoya Talk. And it's portable and smaller than a 19-inch rack. And a typical setup looks like this, where you have the portable wherever it needs to be. Uh, it's 4G, 5G ready. It's Wi-Fi. Uh, there's a firmware update this month, actually, that the Wi-Fi is now on and working. And then there's two Ethernet ports. So you can do redundancy any which way you want to slice it. You can do bonded cellular, you can do ethernet as primary and cellular as backup, you can do Wi-Fi and cellular and all kinds of, or cellular and cellular. You could have Verizon and T-Mobile. There's two SIM card, uh, there's one slot with two SIM cards you can put in there. 
So that will connect to your hardware codec uh, in the studio, or you could have a talk at both ends. Uh, if you need portability on the sending and receiving side. So anything is possible. And I'm going to show you a software solution as well that works with all of this. It's also important to note that the Akoya Talk will work with other third-party codecs using SIP. So there's that word that I mentioned earlier in this presentation. So you can broadcast anywhere. And you'll notice the internet, there's this little cloud icon in the middle of my picture called Akoya Connect. This is a very powerful SIP infrastructure that you can subscribe to with Digigram that gives you other functionality like remote control and other things that I'm going to share with you in more detail. So the Akoya Talk works like a smartphone. It's a touch screen. It's a mixer. It comes with everything you need. There's no gotchas. It comes with the cellular antennas that are very powerful. So even in bad cellular places like my own house, this works perfectly fine. Also, the lithium-ion battery slot that you see there on the right in this picture, there's also another one on the left, so you can have up to 12 hours of battery life. It ships with, a, with an external battery charger. Uh, it also has a 64-gigabyte internal hard drive, so you can record onto the unit. So you can record interviews off-air, play them on-air, you can comment over them, you can record podcasts and then play them live. Lots of different ways this can be used. On the back panel, there's the Ethernet ports I was talking about. There's also USB-C, so you can access the hard drive like a thumb drive. You can dump music on it as, as header and bumper music. You can also grab your interviews later on. The USB, uh, the other USB ports, the more common USB ports that you see, those are for charging your smartphone while you're on air, so that, that's kind of crafty. Uh, there's external ins and outs that are both analog or digital, software controlled, and it comes with an external power supply, and there's also GPIOs that you can trigger. All right, so up to this point, we have talked about the 19-inch rack solutions and the portable. Now I wanna talk about cloud solutions, and this sort of goes to the person on YouTube's question regarding software. So going back to the same picture as I've showed many times before, this is now what we're gonna focus on doing software connections to back to the studio because sometimes you don't always have the ability to send hardware to the remote location. And Akoya Connect is a cloud infrastructure that allows me to administer those software links and also control the hardware remotely. So Akoya Connect, Akoya Guest, and Akoya Guest can also be used mobile. Uh, we can manage, monitor, and remote control our hardware. And then we have this web codec that works on a smartphone, laptop, or desktop computer. Uh, so Akoya Connect allows me to see my infrastructure. Uh, let's say if, so if I'm a radio or TV station, I might have several codecs all over the place. And I can literally monitor and initiate and control this, these codecs. So if I own five or six portables, I don't have to be concerned about what portable unit, what serial number unit went out on location today. All that matters is the person logging into it. That person's settings are stored in the Akoya world and downloaded from the cloud. And then I can take ownership, control the preamp and everything. So I'm gonna, let me talk a little bit more about that. So let's take a baseball, Major League Baseball. Everyone's getting a video feed at home, which is obviously during the pandemic was a big thing. And these hardware, they wanted a professional solution at home. So not every, so that way everybody had the same box. Everybody had the same hardware and same headset. So it was very unified, which is good. But we wanted to control the preamp gain, the headphone mix, the audio signal path from the studio using Akoya Connect. We're one of the only companies that have this capability. So again, it doesn't matter what Akoya box I ship to New Jersey, to California, to Alabama, to Florida. It really it doesn't matter because each person can be set up in software with a login with their own personal mixing settings. I like my talk back in my left ear. I know I'm using an SM7B Shure microphone that has to be at this gain, et cetera, et cetera. So when they log in, bam, all the settings are there. I never have to worry about that. And the person back at the studio can take complete control of that unit. Very, very, very powerful. Take a tennis situation. Now, traditionally, you have a rack somewhere 
on site with a lot of wire coming out of it for microphones, for wireless antennas and all this kind of stuff. Or think golf tournament and, and where you have lots of audio. So I sort of sum all that up with this phrase, audio flexibility. So you could put in a Koya talk under the chair umpire with a microphone and an interview mic after the tournament. You can put in a Koya talk up in the studio. You can put in a Koya talk anywhere in the facility with, with 10 feet of, feet of mic cable instead of running everything back to a rack and minimize your copper cabling. And everything connects back to a serve link or a cross link, depending on how many channels we need, it back in the studio or the truck. And it's all done over IP. And then, of course, we're doing video in this diagram using a technology called LiveView. So just another way to skin the cat. Take another example, remote recording. We were in conversations with a group of uh, the TSDCA group, and we want to record musicians simultaneously remotely, basically using the Internet as a microphone cable. There, you know, there's clever ways of creating the tracks that the singers needed to perform to and getting everybody's audio captured to a DAW at a central location and then sliding everything back in sync. It wasn't important that everybody's in sync with each other as it's as it's happening. What was important is that there was a reference point from everybody so that when we put it in production, we can slide everything back in the DAW. So it's just another way that this technology can be used and one engineer can be in control of the amplifier, the preamp gain, all that kind of stuff. So this gives you some different ideas of how this could be used. So these applications, Akoya Connect, Remote, Monitor, Manage, these are all part of a suite of applications that are in the Akoya Connect, and you can subscribe for a very nominal annual fee. The last piece of the puzzle I want to give you is the software codec solution. This is called Akoya Guest. Akoya Guest is the idea that I cannot send hardware to my remote person. I want to send them a link that they can open up in a web browser. There's no software for them to install. They literally just have their YouTube, I'm sorry, their um, USB headset or even, God forbid, just their laptop speaker and microphone. That'd be the worst case scenario. But a headset, an audio interface maybe, um, and I just send them a link from the studio. So if I'm doing a podcast or I'm doing a live radio show, I need a high quality connection from that person's web browser at home or on their smartphone back to the studio. That's what Akoya Guest is about. And we've done this uh, where we just run Akoya Guest from a browser. Radio stations have been on air remotely just using software. Again, there's hardware at the other destination because that bring, we can take advantage of the technology that I just talked about as far as reliability. But Akoya Guest looks like this. You, you, you get a link, and I'm going to demonstrate this for you in a second, but you get a link and it opens up the window that you see on the left. And if I were to click the little settings gear here where I'm putting my mouse, it goes into these more advanced settings that I can use. And then I hit the arrow to go back to the main screen. And all I have to do is hit the call button. And this works on my smartphone. This works on any web browser um, that was Safari, Chrome, etc. And I can even load a file and play that file. So that file could be an interview. It could be music. Um, we've had music teachers use this technology where sing people can sing along with a backing track. All kinds of ways this can be used. So what I want to do is do this live demonstration using a smartphone. So I want to illustrate several things that I've said on this webinar all at one time. I'm going to illustrate using a third-party codec. So talking about interoperability, I'm going to use a smartphone, not a laptop, and I'm going to use a Koya Guest connecting to a hardware codec. So let me, uh, and I did this video shoot, and then I'm going to play it for you now. Derek Padala here with Synthax and representing Digigram. Today we want to show you the new version of Akoya Guest, using it with not only your web browser, but your smartphone. And how Akoya Guest, along with Akoya Connect, can connect to not only Digigram codecs, but third-party codecs. So today I've elected to use a Comrex Access so we can really show how powerful Akoya Connect and Guest can be in any codec installation. So the diagram below me is your typical broadcast solution. And in this video, we're going to specifically focus on Akoya Guest for smartphone and web browser connecting to the studio with Akoya Connect. 
And also, in as I said earlier, we're going to use a third-party codec. So in our Akoya Connect infrastructure, we will grab the settings for our third-party codec. We will log into our third-party codec GUI and put in those settings, which will register it on the Akoya Connect infrastructure. In addition to that, we will go into Akoya Guest on the Akoya Connect infrastructure and create links that can be sent to third-party folks that are going to connect remotely. And I can assign those links to the third-party codec itself. Once I've done that and I receive the link on my smartphone, I put my link into my smartphone uh, web browser. In this case, it's an iPhone, so this is Safari. And I'm going to go over to the Settings tab by simply tapping on that. And you're going to see some different settings if you've used Akoya Guest before. We have operating mode, audio IOs. You can see it's an iPhone mic this time. We have our usual input options, streaming options, stereo, and quality. So we're going to start there. And you can see when I tap the actual streaming quality, I can choose anything up to 256 down to 32. I'm going to go ahead and choose 256. And I have a choice between stereo or mono. And I'm going to choose stereo. As we move up, I'm going to elect not to use any of the echo cancellation or audio DSP at this time, but I can use it. And since I'm using an iPhone, I only have my iPhone microphone. I'm not using a headset right now. Operating mode. There are three choices. You have the standard, advanced, and light for low power smartphones. We recommend that when you are using a smartphone, otherwise use standard. And when you are using a smartphone that has music files, or using a web browser, you can choose advanced. By choosing advanced, you'll see that it will log reload the software. We now have the file input option, so we can choose to have that on or off. When it's on and we go back to the main screen, we can select a file and load it. And this is also true on a computer. So if you wanted to load a music file and play that or load an interview that you did offline, that's what this feature is for. I'm going to go ahead and disable that. And I'll go back to the low power smart mode. Software will re-download. Now I will click on the back arrow and take us back to the main screen. First thing you're going to see that's new is you have feedback. You know what's going on. Uh, you also can see we're ready to place a call. So it's already made an establishment, uh, established connection with uh, sort of a preliminary connection with Akoya Connect until we actually hit the call button. We have a little counter, a little reminder here that we encourage you to use a headset when going on air. And of course, our mute button. And on the smartphone, you're simply sliding uh, the buttons over. So what we're going to go ahead and do now is we're going to make the call to the Comrex that's behind me. And you can see now that we're connected. I also can see that I have audio on my Comrex. And once I'm done and I want to hang up, simply select the hang up and slide it over. So that's, that's how that works. And hopefully that little demonstration helps you kind of see what's possible. Now, there are several ways to connect. You can have an Akoya guest subscription that is just two links, like a two-way call. Uh, there's a podcast that's being done right now. I think it's called Beer Chips and Politics. And Pat Kaneen is using Akoya Guest to connect to his guests remotely and record them for the podcast. And he gets very high quality audio that way. You also can do Akoya Guest to hardware like I did in the video or third-party codecs. But where most people get excited about this technology is when we start doing multiple guests at once because that opens up a whole nother area of possibilities. So we can scale. We can actually have dozens and dozens and dozens of guests all connecting to separate channels of the ServLink remotely. And we can use that for distance learning, remote translation, churches, et cetera. And I'm going to show some application diagrams where that's really clearly depicted. So I can have a ServLink in the studio uh, or a CrossLink in the studio, and it's receiving multiple guest calls from multiple locations around the world at the same time. And of course, the folks on the remote side, if they have good microphones and audio interfaces, et cetera, it, it raises the level of quality up even more. So that's just other ways in which it could be used. So 
in the end, what I've sort of illustrated to you is this one IP audio solution from Digigram, where we have a portable codec that's hardware with all the advantages that, that brings. We have software. We have the ability to do multi-channel hardware codec connections. So what are some of the setups I can do with this? All right. And of course, we showed this about five times now during this webinar, this different radio TV setup where we have remote broadcasting, connecting to the studio, and then depending on what we're doing, we can distribute the audio out to multicast it to several destinations. But what else can we do? Well, let's say I wanna just set up a home broadcasting solution. So I can have an Akoya talk, I can have a, a third party or a Digigram codec at the station or the studio or the school or whatever, and remote broadcast things that way. Uh, how do I connect multiple venues for remote mixing, remote recording, intercom, expanded seating, or do a remote screening room, let's say? Well, that goes back to the idea of maybe having an Akoya Servlink 88 Dante with a 128 IO or 64 IO upgrade in the first venue and several other serve links in the other venues. And I pretty much can use the internet as a digital audio snake with anywhere from 80 to 180 milliseconds of latency. Um, but everything's in sync with itself using an NTP server. So I can actually do multi-channel audio streaming in full duplex uh, and share audio between all these venues and remix them. Or if I'm a production company and I have several shows out on the road, I might have a serve link on the front of house and then back at the main headquarters, a serve link and I can literally tap into any live show that's going on for troubleshooting, training, remote mixing capabilities. A church, I might have an Akoya uh, at one church and several Akoyas at other churches and those facilities are always connected 24 seven, 365 days. And the reason you wouldn't wanna use software for this is because software is a victim of other variables that sometimes crash. This is gonna. This is designed to work 24-7 with full redundancy, no matter what. How do I give my remote audience satellite radio quality audio performance? Well, we could have an Akoya Crosslink ST at the front of house and just take the audio feed right into it and then broadcast it using a CDN provider and then tell the audience maybe for a smaller fee, but I can monetize the audience that's not there in the venue. Um, I could use this for music recitals at school. I could use this for concerts. I could use this for church, uh, and provide my congregation another means to listen to the, the, the sermon in a very high quality way on the go because video isn't always important in that situation. Otherwise, talk radio would be dead, right? How can I improve audio quality for distance learning or do virtual trade shows, especially trade shows where audio demonstrations and things like that are paramount? Well, we actually have a use case with one of our partners, Duquesne University, and this is exactly what we did. So using a combination of Akoya guest software and Akoya serve link in tandem with a DigiFace Dante from a company by the name of RME, we were able to create a local area network on campus and all the students could call in using a Koya guest and use Zoom for the video. So if you're on Zoom, you always have the option to join internet audio. You simply do not join internet audio and you put your Akoya guest window right next to your Zoom window and connect that way. And then you have a much better quality two-way stereo communication uh, for music or music training or playing audio files if it's pertinent to the curriculum, stuff like that. We also could add a QSIS or a BIAMP system using Dante or AVB with certain conversion capabilities to the same setup as well and have a hybrid of remote learning and local learning going on. Uh, and the same is true using a web radio solution. If you want to have a one-way passive uh, lecture that you want to provide a much better quality listening experience opposed to Facebook and YouTube Live, you could do it this way. And you could put the link to the class behind a password protected uh, domain so that the students or the audience, whether you have to pay to listen or whatever, can hear. And you want to give them a very high quality audio uh, that is going to be uninterrupted and unimpeded as if they were there or they had a headphone feed right from the mixing console. And of course, you could use a hybrid of the two. You might have remote contribution and also a passive audience over web radio. 
how can I design a campus-wide broadcasting streaming solution for universities, sports leagues, etc.? Well, let's take a serve link on the campus. In combination with using portable and software codec technology, we can be broadcasting games, classes, events at the same time, and provide parents and students alike links to listen remotely. It's just one way to do it. You also could use the crosslink to connect to your local affiliate TV or radio stations as well. So you could you could tap into your community broadcasting services to broadcast in traditional ways as in addition to doing what you see here. How can I design a remote translation solution? And there's a couple of ways this could be done. An office situation, maybe you're a multinational company, you have translators off-site listening to the meeting and then in real time translating and then that audio can be tapped into with links on the company's website for Spanish, German, and French is what we're showing in this example. Or let's say you're a church that has campuses around the world or you're doing uh, global ministries and you have something going on in Brazil, Uganda, Cambodia, and Kenya. You might have local translators in those regions. The audio is sent over the internet they can use their cell phone even and listen to the sermon in English and then send their translation back to headquarters and then those can be rebroadcast. So this is just another way this technology could be used. Other possibilities. Well, this has come up more recently is multicasting DJs. So DJs is a very big business, both for the venue and the DJs themselves and DJs that are in demand want to be able to scale their, 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 their abilities, not always have to hire DJs. So they could be at home doing live mix and then with Crosslink STs, basically receiving high quality audio and sending it into the PA for each club separately. So it's a very cost effective way to cover more ground. Then we have you know, more traditional broadcast needs like streaming programs to various distribution points, being able to do terrestrial distribution and replace the cost of satellite using web radio. This is another way to do it or just direct IP to IP connections. Uh, and then also being able to do multiple things like taking satellite, transcoding, taking audio and using IP audio to your transmitter site and having redundancy and everything you need. Uh, so quite, quite a bit of possibilities here. We also could, for those of you that want to set up remote and very compact, powerful broadcast studios um, in combination with a very good audio interface like RME's uh, UFX or Babyface with Total Mix, you can pretty much have your virtual mixing solution, multiple guests there in the studio, and use a Koya guest remotely for all your remote guests. And of course, this is very scalable depending on how big a facility you're looking to make. Um, there's a uh, Matty Face Pro, et cetera. So hopefully this was insightful and helpful. For those of you that have watched, um, thank you very much for your time today. And for those of you that are looking for CTS credit, if you would like to send me your first and last name to my email address there on the slide, I will send you your necessary Avixa certification. You'll receive three CTS credits for this class. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for their time, and uh, hopefully, if there's any other questions, feel free to email me at Derek at Syntax.com, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks.